So I just want to give you a flavor of what research is like in, in diabetes and how we understand diabetes more. Um, I'm going to talk about what's new in medications and what's new in insulins that's available now. I'm going to talk very briefly about what's uh, in the pipeline in terms of future medications. And then on a practical note, I'm going to talk a little bit about insulin, insulin pumps. This is uh, the UK PDS trial. And this was conducted from 1990, sorry, 1977 to 1997. And this study looked at about 5,100 patients in the UK. And these were newly diagnosed um, diabetics with type 2 diabetes. And they wanted to compare what happens if you have tight glucose control versus sort of less tight control. So lower blood sugars versus higher blood sugars. So this is what they found. So in the group of patients who had tight control, they had less complications, less uh, kidney problems, less uh, blindness or eye damage, and possibly less nerve damage from their diabetes. In the group that had lower blood pressure, uh, lower blood pressure, better blood pressure control, they had fewer strokes, they had less deaths, they had less heart failure, um, and uh, less uh, vision problems. What was interesting about this study is that they followed the patients afterwards. So after uh, 1997, they, they followed these patients for another 10 years to see what would happen. And this was, uh, at that point, at the end of the study, they stopped you know, distinguishing between tight control and, and uh, less tight control. So everybody had the same, more or less the same treatment. Uh, so after 10 years, they reported the results in September 2008. And here are the results. So at the end of the study is where that arrow is, pointing down. So the blue line is the people with less tight blood sugar control. And the red line is the people who had the tighter blood sugar control. So their blood sugar A1C, hemoglobin A1C level was lower. So at, by the, after the end of the study, what happens is the two groups, their, their blood sugar control started to become about the same. So the two lines kind of merge. So after this study, the original study was finished, people kind of more or less had the same glucose control. But what happened to those two groups of people? Well, let's focus on the left graph. So this is a graph of the complications. During the study, the people with the um, better control of diabetes, the red line, had fewer complications. So we mentioned that in the first few slides. Now let's look at the graph on the right side. So this is the longer time out from the beginning of the study. So even after the study, 10 years later, the group that had initially better control still had fewer complications from their diabetes, even though after the first 10 years, their sugar control was, was the same in both groups. Similar thing happened with blood pressure control. So after the study, the blood pressures more or less became the same in both groups. So the take home messages, I'm just gonna skip all the writing and get to the, get to the bottom line. The bottom line is if you have early good control of your diabetes, you get a long-lasting effect in terms of prevention of complications. So the earlier good control you have, the better it is. The blood pressure is a little bit different. So even if you had good blood pressure control at the beginning, if your blood pressure is not quite as good later, um, you don't get the same benefit. So with blood sugars, there's a legacy effect. So if you have early on good control, you get that legacy effect of prevention of complications later in life. So that's very important to know if you're newly diagnosed. Um, whereas with blood pressure, you really need to maintain good blood pressure control throughout your life in order to get the benefits of low blood pressure or good blood pressure. Next, I'm going to talk about insulin. So these are the discoverers of insulin. We know that uh, we all know that insulin was discovered in Toronto. So it's a Canadian um, scientific uh, discovery. So your body um, produces insulin. Uh, there's a basal kind of production of insulin. So even when you're not eating, there's always a little bit of insulin production. And if you eat, and that's represented by the red arrows, um, your insulin levels will spike if you don't have diabetes. So when we give you insulin, or when you take insulin, or when your doctor prescribes insulin, we want to kind of mimic this pattern. So you get uh, kind of a basal insulin or and a mealtime insulin, usually. So even just several years ago, we only had human insulin. So these were kind of formulated to give you an intermediate acting insulin and a regular acting insulin for meals and then kind of a longer acting or intermediate acting insulin for uh, your basal insulin. But now we've got um, a number of um, new insulins and these are what we call analog insulins. And um, 
there have been kind of tweaked to uh, give you kind of a more um, better time effect so that the mealtime insulins kick in faster so you can take them just uh, as soon as you eat or even sometimes right after you eat. And the longer acting insulins, rather than having to take them twice a day, they're formulated so that you can take them once a day. And of course they also come in pre-mixed versions. So this uh, diagram is the human molecule, a human insulin molecule. This is sort of the natural insulin that, that uh, your body would produce. And it's got two components. There's an A chain or alpha chain and a B chain or beta chain. So the synthetic or analog insulins, they take the human insulin molecule and they modify it in different ways. So the next uh, thing I'm going to talk about now are gut hormones. So when we think about diabetes, we talk a lot about insulin. But one of the new discoveries are these certain gut hormones that uh, we didn't know about until recently. Um, so when you eat, if you have diabetes, there's a couple of problems um, with the pancreas. The um, beta cell produces less insulin, so you don't get good glucose control. And the alpha cell in the pancreas produces too much glucagon, which is kind of a counterbalance to insulin. So you end up having um, less insulin produced, and you end up having more uh, resistance to insulin, and that leads to hyperglycemia, or high blood sugars. So where the gut hormones come in is when you eat, your gut actually produces different hormones. Um, these are, some of them are called GIP and GLP-1, and these have a direct effect on the pancreas. So it kind of reverses those problems. The alpha cell produces less glucagon and the beta cell releases more insulin. Uh, so you have more um, glucose going into your muscles and being stored in your fat, and the liver releases less glucose into the bloodstream. So you end up having better blood glucose control. So some of the new drugs will take advantage of these gut hormones. Um, there's really two classes. Uh, there's actually three, but um, the two main ones are um, an incretin mimetic analog or a GLP-1 analog. And then there are drugs called DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, which actually increases the GLP-1 hormone. So the one that I've highlighted, the uh, row I've highlighted, are the DPP-4 inhibitors. And the reason is because these ones are available in Canada. They're available now. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about insulin pumps. So these are small computerized devices that deliver insulin continuously throughout the day. So it uh, puts insulin under your skin 24 hours a day. You have to program the pump. You program it to give you that basal insulin rate throughout the whole day. So you have a little bit of insulin even when you're not eating. And then you set the amount of insulin to cover the amount of carbohydrates that you eat. So when you have a meal, the pump will deliver um, a bolus or a higher uh, dose of uh, insulin to cover that meal. With the insulin pump, it's going to mimic your own body's pancreas and deliver the insulin in a more physiologic manner. So what's new about insulin pumps? Well, they're getting smarter. Um, you can have different bolus types depending on the type of food. So if you have a, a very fast carbohydrate, you can have a bolus that gives you more of the insulin up front, or if you're taking a slower carbohydrate or complex carbohydrate, the insulin pump will give you that bolus over a longer period of time. Um, they have a built-in bolus calculator, so you can just tell the pump how much you're eating, and it'll calculate how much insulin you need. So, of course, the, the um, kind of holy grail of the insulin pump is to have a closed loop, meaning that the pump will automatically deliver insulin and calculate your blood sugar and deliver the right amount so you don't have to, to do the calculation yourself. People are also looking into developing an implanted pump so that you don't have to wear it. It'll actually be put inside of you and um, so you don't have that uh, hassle of having to, to carry it around. So on a practical note, um, you know, the pumps can be very expensive. I think they're about $5,000 each, so uh, the cost can be very prohibitive. But the Ontario government has um, now stepped up to pay for insulin pumps, but only for type 1 diabetics. Um, so it'll pay for the insulin pump, plus it'll give you a stipend or an annual grant for the pump supplies, up to $2,400. Um, in order to qualify for a pump, you have to demonstrate that you have an ongoing commitment to glucose testing, so you have to monitor your blood sugars. Um, you have to um, learn how to use a pump safely. So I'm just going to end off on this slide. So you can see that the pace of progress and research and development of new things in diabetes is, is kind of growing exponentially. And so it remains a very exciting field for uh, research and to be uh, someone involved in looking after patients with diabetes. Thank you very much.